In part two of the book, Rotti was concerned with irony and philosophy, right? So some of the writers that we were looking at there, people like Nietzsche, Heidegger, Derrida, were people who, for Rotti, had the ironist insight, right? They were trying to get out of metaphysics, uh, but they were still writing within the tradition of philosophy. And so Rotti's question in part two of the book was, is this possible? How is it possible? What do you have to do to make this possible? And his answer turned out to be that, you know, in Derrida, what we see um, is that at least on Rotti's interpretation of Derrida, what Derrida does is he stops theorizing, right? He starts writing contingent, personal works full of associations um, that work for him, but make no claim to generality. In this third part of the book, to which we turn now, Rotti is going to talk not about philosophy, but about literature. And he will be concerned not so much with the attempt to create ourselves through telling this completely um, idiosyncratic story of private associations. He will be concerned with the public use of literature. He will be concerned with books that allow us to become better people in the sense of more sensitive to cruelty, more sensitive to each other, you know, better people to be around, better people to, to have in your society. And so what Rotti is going to do in uh, this third part of the book is he's going to talk about, well, how does, how does literature do this? That's one of the questions. How does literature generate this kind of solidarity? But he will be especially concerned with showing that all of that is possible and can be understood and maybe can even be best understood from his own ironist perspective. And so the two writers that Derrida, uh, sorry, that Rorty is going to talk about in chapter seven and chapter eight are Vladimir Nabokov, the Russian American, mostly Russian American writer. Um, so he wrote his first books in Russian and then he started writing books in English. So Vladimir Nabokov in chapter seven, and then George Orwell, the British author in chapter eight. Why does Rorty choose Nabokov and Orwell? Well, I guess one reason is that he thinks that they are very important writers. And a second reason is that he believes that their books help us overcome cruelty, right? They help us become more sensitive. But I think the main reason that Rorty takes on Nabokov and Orwell specifically is that both of them seem to have a kind of metaphysical story about what they are doing. Um, either they have it themselves or some of their you know, critics and interpreters have it, but a metaphysical story about what they're doing and why it matters that doesn't fit Rorty's ironist position. And so what Rorty does is he tries to make things difficult for himself, right? He tries to make things difficult for himself by taking on these two cases of writers who clearly help in the fight against cruelty and who seem to do that from a kind of metaphysical motivation that Rotti has to reject. And so what Rotti is going to do in both chapter seven and chapter eight is argue against a particular metaphysical interpretation of an author in order to show that his own ironist reading of that author actually makes more sense of them, actually makes more sense of the ways that that author combats cruelty. So chapter seven is about Nabokov, the barber of Kasbiam, Nabokov on cruelty, and the barber of Kasbiam, as we learn later in the chapter, is uh, a very small scene from the most famous novel of Nabokov, Lolita. This chapter starts with sort of Rotti setting out the general terrain. He tells us on page 141 that the books which help us become less cruel can be roughly divided into one, books which help us to see the effects of social practices and institutions on others, and two, those which help us see the effects of our private idiosyncrasies on others. Um, what he does is he spends some time arguing against the distinction of books in those that have a moral purpose and those that have an aesthetic purpose, right? Some books you read to become a better person, some books you read because they give you artistic pleasure, something like that. Um, Rotti doesn't really think that that, is, that that is a useful distinction to make. He doesn't believe that that's a useful distinction to make because it seems to require us to, 
to split humans into these different parts. There's sort of our moral part, and then there is our, our aesthetic part. You know, sometimes we're concerned with the good, and sometimes we're concerned with the beautiful. Um, and those are distinctions that Rorty things are, um, you know, leftovers of old metaphysical ways of thinking. They don't really clarify things. He wants us to try to, to think about books in a different way. His preferred classification is set out at the bottom of page 142 and then page 143, where he says, you know, we shouldn't ask, does this book aim at truth or beauty? We should ask, what purposes does this book serve? Our first broadest classification of purposes will be built around two distinctions. The first is that between the range of purposes presently statable within some familiar, widely used final vocabulary and the purpose of working out a new final vocabulary. Right, so that is the distinction between books that fit our current genres and ideas about literature that you can safely put on a particular shelf in the bookstore and when somebody comes to you and says, "What? what's that kind of book? You say, oh, you know, it's a bit like that, uh, accept it with space pirates. Um, so that would be the first kind of thing. And then the second kind of thing would be the kind of book that, that fits with the, the strong poet paradigm, right? Where we're trying to do something new, where we're trying to write in a new way, where we're trying to talk in a new way, trying to think in a new way, trying to work out a new way of looking at things. There are only very few books of the letter sword, Rorty says. And when we look at that latter class of books, we can again divide them into those books aimed at working out a new private final vocabulary and those aimed at working out a new public final vocabulary. The former is a vocabulary deployed to answer questions like, what shall I be? What can I become? What have I been? The latter is a vocabulary deployed to answer questions like, what sorts of things about what sorts of people do I need to notice? Do I need to notice? What we see here is a very important idea for Rorty uh, when it comes to literature. It's the idea that, that literature helps us become, you know, that the kind of public, new public final vocabulary that literature can help us establish is a new public vocabulary that makes us less cruel. And he thinks that we become less cruel by noticing other people, right? Not just by noticing that they are there, right? I mean, you can hardly fail to see that somebody is there, although although even that is, is kind of possible. Um, but we, we don't just want to notice that they are there. We want to, to learn about them, right? We want to understand them. We want to, to see what's going on in them, how they feel, how they see things, right? It's only if we do that, it's only if we become sensitive to other people, if we learn to notice other people um, as they notice themselves, as they think of themselves and as they feel themselves, that we can in, in any sense, you know, even even hope to be successful in making our own conduct conducive to their welfare. So we need to become sensitive to people if we want to become less cruel. Uh, and so that is precisely what great literature for Rotti, great literature in its public use can do for us. It makes us more sensitive to other people. Um, in, a, in a later article, I believe it is a later article, Rotti, uh, Rotti writes about literature. The, the title of that later article is um, Redemption from Egotism, right? where egotism, with a T, not egoism, but egotism, um, is just you know being totally absorbed in your own world, not even noticing others, not even noticing that other people have needs that are different from yours, um, have experiences that are different from yours, and so on and so forth. That's what literature can do, according to Rotti. It can bring us a redemption from egotism. So how does that work out in the writer who is the subject of this particular chapter, Vladimir Nabokov? Well, the strange thing about Nabokov for Rotti is that he has a very, I mean, he seems to have a very peculiar story about what he himself is doing tied to a very peculiar metaphysical theory. So at page 146, what Rorty tells us is this. He says, in the remainder of this chapter, I shall offer a reading of Nabokov, 
which connects three of his traits, his aestheticism, his concern with cruelty, and his belief in immortality. And so what is going on in, in Nabokov, according to Rotti, is, well, first of all, there are many passages where Nabokov talks about his own art, um, where he seems to espouse aestheticism, right? The idea that the only thing that's important about art is beauty, that the only thing that's important about art is art, that he himself, Vladimir Nabokov, has precisely no moral purpose, precisely no social purpose. So according to Rotti, um, or really, I mean, according to Nabokov himself, you can just read these passages. According to Nabokov himself, he should be understood in the kind of terms that Rotti wants to get rid of. This distinction between the moral and the aesthetic. And he, Nabokov, should be placed squarely within the aesthetic because he is making real art. He is not making anything um, that we should think of as, as, as moral or political or social or something like that. Okay, so that is, of course, in a sense, a problem for Rotti, right? Because Nabokov's self-description is very different from the kind of description that Rotti will want to end up giving of Nabokov. And so Rotti is going to have to argue that Nabokov misunderstands himself. And that when we look at, at Nabokov's real concerns, we see something that actually fits Rotti's picture better then it fits Nabokov's picture. Okay, what does that have to do with his concern with cruelty uh, and his belief in immortality? Well, so Nabokov, let's first look at the relation between aestheticism and a belief in immortality. Uh, Nabokov seems to hold that when you get these like moments of aesthetic pleasure, you know, that is somehow an intimation of immortality. These, these moments of aesthetic bliss, as he calls them in the afterword to Lolita, uh, seem to be, for Nabokov, sort of indications that immortality is possible, that there might be such a thing as personal immortality. At the same time, Nabokov seems to be telling himself a kind of story about literary immortality. Right, where if you are a writer who is able to generate aesthetic bliss, then you will achieve literary immortality, which is true, right? In the sense, in 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 you know the, the metaphorical sense that your books will still be read, um, but somewhere on Rotti's reading, at least, Nabokov is trying to set up this this kind of private mythology, where being a writer who manages to generate aesthetic bliss is a sort of guarantee ticket not just to literary immortality, but to the actual immortality of which a static bliss is an intimation or indication. Now that, of course, is a sort of metaphysical story, right? If you are able to generate a static bliss, or maybe if you're able to experience a static bliss, ooh, you know, you're, you're on the road to real immortality. Um, and Rotti basically sort of dismisses this out of hand as something that, that you know, we, we can't really take seriously as a metaphysical theory. And in fact, he, he suggests that Nabokov himself can't take it seriously as a metaphysical theory. That although it is sort of in the background of his motivations, that this sort of animates him, nevertheless, he is well aware that it doesn't really make sense as a theoretical construct. Okay, so that will be aestheticism and immortality. Um, and it's an explanation for Rotti of why Nabokov might be saying things that sound like very metaphysical and very aestheticist, like I, I, want, um, I want to have this immortality and so on and so forth. But that, that doesn't actually make much sense. And so can't be the best story that we can tell about what Nabokov is doing. The best story that we can tell about what Nabokov is doing, according to Rotti, becomes only possible when we add in this third element, which is his concern with cruelty. And Rotti paints a picture of Nabokov as somebody who is able to experience states of bliss, right? To be like totally blissful, unconcerned, um, but who at the same time, and maybe because of that, 
is very, very sensitive to the misery of other people. Right? He can't abide the misery of other people. He hates the misery of other people. He worries about the misery of other people. And one of the things in which he, which he particularly worries about is having himself been the cause of the misery of other people, having caused, having made other people miserable. And so what he is concerned about is not so much that he is going to be like totally evil, like he is going to, I don't know, kill people for pleasure or something like that. Uh, he is concerned that without noticing, he might be hurting other people. He is concerned that he might not even realize that he has been hurting other people while hurting them maybe all the time. Right, and so what he is concerned with is this possibility that we are really bad at understanding others, at noticing others, at being sensitive to others, and that that might be a source of a lot of cruelty. And in fact, what makes things worse on Rotti's reading is that it's precisely the aestheticism that makes, you know, that makes the bulk of himself extra vulnerable. If you are the kind of person who cares about moments of aesthetic bliss, if you are the kind of person who really gets absorbed into literature and literary projects and, and writing this book and, and thinking through this idea and so on and so forth, if you are that kind of sort of obsessive self-absorbed person, then of course you might also be the kind of person who is especially bad at noticing other people, who is especially bad at understanding other people's point of view, at understanding other people's experiences. If you are totally absorbed in your own experience, totally absorbed in your own way of, of thinking in your own projects, then you are a prime suspect for the kind of cruelty that comes from not noticing others. And so Rotti says, Nabokov, um, you know, on the one hand, he uses immortality to try to tell himself this nice little story. It's the story that he as a writer is in special contact with immortality. And it's also the story that all those people who have misery now, you know, if there's immortality, then at least there's the hope that at one point they're going to be happy. And this for Rotti is especially, according to Rotti, is especially important for Nabokov because he doesn't believe in social hope. Right? He doesn't have social hope. He doesn't think that society can get meaningfully better. So if society can't get meaningfully better, then the, maybe the only way to keep cruelty, to keep the despair at other people's misery at bay, the only way to be able to deal with the fact that there is so much misery in the world is to believe in immortality, is to believe that people will get to a happy state at some point. And so Nabokov's sort of comforting mythology according to Rorty, is this story where he is a writer. That means that, you know, he is an expert in aesthetic bliss. That is what gives us intimations of immortality. Immortality is what makes, you know, suffering bearable. Um, and so he, as a writer, writing his books is in some sense, you know, doing what he can in order to make things better. But that's just a comfort thought. Right, and the worry, the worry that by being a writer, he might be precisely hurting other people, that by being a writer, what he might be doing is precisely um, to, to not notice others, and that this not noticing might make him the cause of much harm, of much suffering, which in turn, he doesn't even notice. You know, that is the worry. That is the, 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 the deep, dark pit beneath the comforting story about immortality. And according to Rotti, once we understand that this is the way that, that Nabokov's thinking goes, the way that Nabokov's fears go, then we can come to his most famous books and see this exactly play out. Because in his most famous books, and the two books that, uh, that Rotti is especially interested in are Lolita and Pale Fire. Um, in both of those books, the protagonist is a sort of an, an astid, somebody who is a really good writer, uh, somebody who, who really has the artistic gifts almost or even entirely of a Nabokov himself. 
and who uses them in ways that clearly presuppose them not noticing other people, not caring about the point of view of other people, like being completely absorbed in their own egotistic, selfish experience of the world. And so what Nabokov is doing in these books, according to Rorty, is he is, he is confronting his own fear. Right? He is confronting the fear that being an astute writer might make you cruel. And in confronting those fears, in creating these, these literary characters, he allows us, and himself presumably, he allows us to become more able to notice the cruelty that we are capable of. The cruelty that comes from incuriosity. The cruelty that comes from not noticing others. Let me just say a little, little bit about these books. So Lolita is, is probably, no, is certainly Nabokov's most famous book. Um, it's about a guy called Humbert Humbert. Well, I guess he's not actually called Humbert Humbert. Um, but that's, that's what we call him in the book. And this guy is basically a pedophile. Right, he um, falls in love with relatively young girls, and the entire book is about his attempt to seduce um, and live a life with one girl called Lolita. So here is here is one of the first things in the book. Did she have a precursor? That is Lolita. She did, indeed, she did. In point of fact, there might have been no Lolita at all. Had I not loved one summer a certain initial girl child in a princedom by the sea? Oh, when? About as many years before Lolita was born as my age was that summer. You can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. You can always, I mean, there was a, a, an Edgar Allan Poe allusion in there, and there was like, um, I mean, clearly this guy was writing a fancy prose style. And he's a murderer, and he connects the two, right? You can always count on a murderer for a fancy prose style. Here, immediately at the beginning of the book, we have sort of cruelty, um, and being a successful artist sort of brought together. Well, that is precisely what, what Rorty says Nabokov is worried about, what he wants to explore. So that seems to be a pretty good indication that that is indeed what is going on. So one of the things that happens in this book is um, it's a scene that Rorty retells in his chapter. It's this scene about the barber where Humbert is like he is in this chair and he is being, you know, his hair is being cut by a barber. And the barber is, you know, telling him some stuff about his son. And, and our protagonist is completely uninterested. He's absorbed in his own thoughts. And it's like at the end of the entire story that the old man has been telling him, that he suddenly realizes that this son has been dead for decades, right? That this is an old man, after all those decades, still grieving about his lost, talented son. That was cruelty. Right? Somebody bearing their heart to you, telling you about their deepest griefs, and you not even noticing what they're saying. Right? That is cruelty. Um, and so, in a sense, the entire, the entire one could say the entire um, narrative line of Lolita follows the protagonist into achieving at least some sense of his own incuriosity, some sense of his own cruelty, um, some understanding of the kind of monster that he has been. Well, that's a little bit different from Pale Fire. Um, I think Pale Fire, it's, it's Rorty says slightly, well, I don't know whether he says less about it, but it's such, an, um, such a strange book in, in the way that it is set up that it, it can't hurt if I show it to you. And by the way, I can absolutely recommend both of these books. I mean, read them if you, if you want to. Um, if you can, if you are, do have the opportunity. Pale Fire consists of two parts. The first part, as you can see here, um, is a poem. Canto One, it says there. A canto is a, a part of a, of a long poem, like, um, like the div Divine Comedy of Dante, for instance, is, is built up out of cantos. And so we have four, four cantos, and this is all written by a guy called Shade, 
Um, and, you know, it's a nice poem, which is clearly about the suicide of his daughter. Okay, so this is a guy showing us his deepest grief, the suicide of his daughter, trying to, to get to grips with that. And then, and this is by far the thickest part of the book, like this, this is the poem, and it's not thick, and this is the rest of the book. Um, and the rest of the book is just notes, right? Notes by specific lines. So it says lines one, two, four. And then we have, and these are four lines, like four little phrases of poetry. Uh, and the commentary to lines one to four is an entire page. Um, and this is gonna, you know, happen again and again, is that the commentary written by a guy called Kin Booty uh, is, is much, much longer than the poem itself. And in this commentary, we get to know the relation between Kim Boti and Shade. Um, we get we learn that Kim Boti wanted Shade to write a poem about his own life, Kim Boti's life. Uh, that he really wanted Shade to do that, and that he has been pestering him non-stop with stories about that life, about everything that happened to him, the country that he came from, and so on and so forth. And then Shade died, and you know what did he have? Well, he had this poem about the suicide of his daughter. And so the entire final part of the book, which is by far the longest, is Kim Bodhi's bizarre attempt to interpret Shade's poem as actually not being about that suicide, because that would be merely sentimental, but being about him, about Kim Bodhi, which is like an, an, a bizarrely exaggerated version of the kind of of not noticing right it's it's like an almost perverse not noticing an almost perverse literary egotism but what makes it so fascinating and what makes it so fascinating for roti is that this kin Booty is actually much more interesting than shade that you know the commentary is actually the greater work of art and so again we are exploring this relation um, between, on the one hand, artistic merit, artistic talent, and on the other hand, this self-obsessed, unnoticing cruelty of the artist. Um, and so that is what, what Rotti wants to take away from this. And of course, I mean, the upshot of this entire story, if Rotti is right, uh, is that the right way to understand Nabokov is not in terms of some metaphysical story about art for art's sake or immortality and, and aesthetic bliss being the, the road to immortality or something like that. No, what Nabokov is struggling with is precisely the fact that he himself might be a cruel, nasty person. And he's trying to make us more sensitive to other people. And he's helping us become better people, less cruel people by doing that. And the entire story about immortality and bliss is a sort of, if Rorty is right again, um, is a sort of almost a, a bad faith attempt to deal with his own fears. But, you know, the non-bad faith attempt to deal with his own fears, like the great attempt to deal with his own fears, is writing books like Lolita and Pale Fire. And that is where we, too, can profit. So that is what I wanted to say about that, I think. Let's see if there is some final Rotti quote I want to end with. Well, you know, let's just end the video by reading the last sentences of the chapter. The Bokov knew as well as John Shade, so that's the poet from Pale Fire. The Bokov knew as well as John Shade did that all one can do with such gifts is sort out one's relations to this world, the world in which ugly and ungifted children like Shade's daughter and the boy Joe, that's from the Dickens novel that Rotti has been discussing, are humiliated and die. Nabokov's best novels are the ones which exhibit his inability to believe his own general ideas. And so that really would be the triumph of a Rotian reading over a metaphysical reading of Nabokov. Now we are going to see this same sort of project, like trying to have a, an ironist Rotian reading prevail over a more metaphysical reading, 
when we come to all wall in the next chapter um, and there Rorty is going to have an even tougher nut to crack because Orwell himself talks about his own books um, and particularly about 1984 as an attempt to safeguard objective truth. 